dance was also a part of the event um, as our in-store guests tonight. So if you have any questions, please do send those through to us. Um, you can do so by um, typing them in the chat box. They'll go to my colleague Chrissy, who um, you just saw now is monitoring the Zoom room and um, she will be able to um, read them out for us later so that Emma can answer them. Um, my name is Emma Kate. I'm a writer and the deputy online editor of Art Magazine. And I'm also one half of the Avid Reader events program. Um, so you might recognize me from there. Usually I'm hosting events rather than doing in conversations, but um, occasionally there's a book that grabs my attention and I just have to be the person to do the in conversation. And this is one of those. Um, when it landed in the inbox, I quickly messaged um, Brendan and said, hey, I'd really like to put my hand up for this one. And he very kindly said um, that he thought we would be a good match. So um, I'm really excited to be here. And um, I just wanted to um, give you a little bit of um, an introduction to Irma before we um, jump into the conversation. So Irma is an award-winning author and editor. She has previously published a short fiction collection, Two Steps Forward, and her short fiction has been widely published in anthologies and journals like Mianjin, Island, Westerly, Going Down Swinging, and Review of, of Australian Fiction, among many others. She has also published three children's books, with another two forthcoming in, two, in 2021, um, although she has just told me that one of them is now coming out in 2022, which is um, a welcome, a welcome um, later release. Um, the Breaking is her debut novel. It won the New South Wales Writers' Centre Varuna Fellowship Award and also received development funding from Arts ACT and KAPO. Irma is ambassador for Thailand's Save Elephant Foundation and she has worked with rescued elephants in Chiang Mai, Surin and Kanchanaburi. So Irma, first things first, um, congratulations. This, thank you. <laughs> this is your debut novel and um, it's been released within the last week. So I just wanted to know what this past week's been like and um, how are you feeling now that this book is out in the world? It's been really crazy. Um, I've still been working full time and I have three kids as well to wrangle. So trying to fit in all the publicity stuff on top of that has been a little bit nuts. Uh, but it's also been amazing, like starting to get the first reader responses and things that I didn't necessarily expect. So everyone keeps telling me the book's a page turner, which I didn't realise, <laughs> um, which has really been lovely. And um, yeah, just all the support as well from the writers community has just been so nice. You know, people posting about the book and sending messages and yeah, it's been really lovely. And the first reviews have started coming in and they've been really positive. So fingers crossed it all just keeps going like that. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome and no doubt that it will. I'm so surprised to hear that you didn't realise that it was a page turner. It really does. Within the opening pages, when you pick it up, you are thrown into the narrative within the first few pages. You are on an adventure with the two girls that you met. Um, heading out into um, on an unexpected journey for our protagonist Hannah, um, that's for sure. Um, we will get in. Oh, sorry, oh, no, I was just going to say I definitely did as I was writing it, or more actually through the editing process, thinking about the forward propulsion for the reader. I just didn't realise I'd <laughs> quite thrown the reader forward so much. Maybe <laughs> <laughs> I think it's great. It gets you 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 feel immersed from the get go, and you're in the thick of it with her, which I think is really um, is really great for this kind of novel where some where your protagonist is in uh, a new environment. Um, so as a reader, should, we're there with her. Yeah. Um, so I thought we'd start by um, talking about elephants. Um, the book is really focused on them and their beauty, um, but also the tourist industry that threatens them. Um, and these are some of the novel's primary concerns. And I wanted to know that when you decided to write about this topic, um, did you always think that you would approach it through fiction or were there times when you considered? I never considered non-fiction just because it's not what I write. But in actual fact, when I set out to write this book, I didn't even know that it was going to be about elephants. Um, so I had just got back from Thailand and these two characters, Devon and Hannah, just kind of arrived on the page fully formed. And at first I thought that I was actually just writing a short story and 
I really wanted to write a story that was full of kind of joy because a lot of my writing tends to go to darker places. <laughs> Such an irony. Um, anyway, so I wrote this, this, what I thought was a short story, and I took it to my um, writing group, and they said, well, this is great, but what happens next? So I thought, okay, I'll go and write, like, a second linked story. So I went off and I did that, and I brought it back to my writers group, and they were like, well, this is great, but what happens next? <laughs> and um, one of the writers said to me, well, maybe you're actually writing a novel. I thought, yeah, maybe this, this could actually be a novel. So I didn't actually set out to write about elephants at all. And I think that's actually really important because the book is, in fact, character driven rather than issues driven. Um, so I think that actually, it, like, it's not a treaty on, you know, elephants in the tourism industry. It really is a story about two women and their relationship and how that develops and evolves and changes within the context of the landscape that they're moving through, which is, you know, the issues that relate to elephant tourism. Mm. Mm. So the, the characters, I did have a question about that later <laughs> because I think a lot of people, especially the writers in the room, will be um, interested to hear about two characters arriving fully formed. So why do you think this is? Where did those characters, those did those characters come to you while you were in Thailand or when you? No, when I got back. I actually have no idea, but it was a really interesting, so I'd been volunteering at the sanctuary on that trip and it was a really interesting space to be in because um, the, there were two main groups of people there who were not like me. And so as a writer, it means you're really kind of observing how these different people are actually engaging with um, the volunteering. So one group was people whose kids were grown up and they were off travelling for a couple of months. And the other group was young people who were travelling, who just had this kind of endless freedom. And it's that kind of time of life where you don't necessarily know who you are, but you've got all this time to go exploring. And I guess as somebody who at that time, you know, I've got three children, I can't go travelling for months at a time, probably there was a part of me that was like, oh, that, that freedom is so appealing. And maybe that's what kind of drew me to write about those characters who were in their early 20s um but yeah as I, said, I didn't really I didn't yeah I didn't consciously kind of think them up so I guess they came out of that space but they're not anybody who I met or you know I can't relate them to anybody in particular they just arrived they just arrived <laughs> how about the other characters in the book did they did they come with as much ease yeah they did this was actually Probably writers are going to hate me for saying this. This was actually an easy first draft to write. It just literally flowed out of me. And I can say that because the book that I'm working on now, where I'm about to go into the third draft, has been really hard one. That first draft was really hard. But this book, I wrote it for me really quickly. So I wrote it within about eight months. And um, that was just working two mornings a week. So because I work full time as an editor, I just decided I was going to carve out sort of three hours on two days. And every time I got to sit down, it was just like this delicious pleasure. And I would just sit and write and it just came out. So and I felt like I was going on the adventure with these characters. I didn't know where it was actually going to go. So the ending surprised me. Um, and yeah, it was it just kind of flowed out. I think you definitely are going to get some um, opinions through, <laughs> if not in the room tonight, then definitely on Zoom. Don't hold back. That is a very unique experience. I think it's great. I'm sure I will never have it again. <laughs> <laughs> um, can you um, talk a bit about how you um, ensured that the picture that you paint of Thai culture um, is a is an accurate one? Is one yeah. that you feel is honest and accurate? You mentioned that you were there. You spent time there yourself. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I was very lucky to get a grant at one point to go back there and do some more work and really kind of get deeper into what was happening in the tourism industry. But while I was there, I always record all of the details of everything that I'm seeing. So, um, you know, videos and photos, not the kind that you would post on social media, just all the like little things that make up the everyday kind of life and kept a journal, but again, the same kind of things, like all those little details that really bring a place to life. Um, and I used all of that when I was writing. So often when I sat down to write, I would just play maybe a minute or two of one of those videos, and that would immediately take me back into that 
space and how it feels to be in Thailand. So that was really useful. And that was part of the reason, I guess, why I also wanted to write it quickly. I didn't want to lose that sense of what it's actually like to be in that country. And then once I written a, uh, a couple of drafts I think it was then I went to my Thai friends I went to Thai expats so I had a whole load of people read the book and give me feedback to let me know if there was anything that I hadn't got right which was really important to me I wanted to get it all exactly right and I had uh, two great um, people who went through all of the Thai in the book to make sure that was spot on because I don't actually speak Thai so there's a bit of Thai throughout the book but I, I don't you know other than learning you know phrases and words when I was there which I immediately forget as soon as I leave because I'm terrible um, so that was really useful yeah yeah and um, when it comes to the I mentioned in my introduction that you're an ambassador for save elephants so when it comes to the um, what you've learned about elephant tourism in Thailand as well. I know that you said that it wasn't the, uh, what you had originally said about writing, but it is a major theme in the book. Can you talk a bit about your experience of that and how you um, convey the complexity of it in the novel? Because I think you really address that well as well through how your characters both deal with that, the confronting reality of that, and also have to um, fight against their own urges in those instances or their own reactions. Now, well, part of writing the book for me was actually about being able to go into this deeper and really explore it and find out what all of those kind of grey areas were. Because I think whenever you think about a kind of topic on the surface, it looks very black and white. So you can say, well, we shouldn't be chaining elephants 24-7 and we shouldn't be working them 10 hours a day and, and putting people on their backs and all these kind of things. But it's not that simple, especially because um, in Thailand, you know, for a lot of people, the elephant might be the only way they have to earn a living. So the elephant is suffering, but then if the elephant's not able to work, then the people are going to suffer. So there's, you know, there's this balance. And of course, there's not very many elephants left in the wild. There used to be like 100,000 in Thailand. And now there's about 2,000. The estimates kind of vary, but... Um, and their habitat is, is obviously being encroached on very dramatically. So there are all these kind of issues which there are no simple answers for. And, you know, part of writing the book was actually exploring all of that complexity, which is in the book, you know, and there's people won't come away from it with a simple answer because there really aren't any. Mm -hmm. And I, I guess I think about, you know, as ambassador for the Save Elephant Foundation, one of the things they're trying to do is find ways to make sure that projects fulfill like kind of ecotourism criteria so um, and there's a range of you know projects that kind of fall on a spectrum so with the worst scenario you're obviously having a, an elephant that's chained 24 7 and when it's not working and the best is the elephant being in the wild but in the middle there's all these kind of you know ecotourist options where the elephant doesn't suffer they're not being hit with a bull hook for example um, and tourists are still able to engage with them and that's like a compromise. Mm. It's not the ideal for the elephant but it's obviously much better and it means that the Thai people can still earn an income. So, but there's just no, there's no easy simple answers. Yeah, definitely not and I think that you, um, you've approached the topic really, um, really well, especially for people who um, relate to Hannah at the beginning of the novel who really has arrived in Thailand and doesn't have um, much knowledge at all of the culture or what what um, happens with elephant tourism there, or even how much um, bar, Thai bar is worth to um, to buy a beer. Yeah. Um, so I think that um, you've approached that complexity in such a in such a clever way. And when you mentioned that those um, that compromise in the um, in ecotourism, where there's sort of a little bit of give and take, I feel as though the characters. We'll talk a little bit more about Devon in a minute. But um, even Devon, who is a lot more um, worldly than Hannah um, and teaches Hannah a lot about Thailand in general and about the elephants in particular, even she has to, at that point, um, realise that a lot of her anger towards the people who inflict the pain on the elephants is, is, is misplaced because really it's the tourists and yeah. people like, not, not like herself because of how she's behaving in the country, but people who are like her, Australian and from other countries who are going and, and funding that and making that lifestyle the only, one of the only sustainable ones. Yeah, because if all of the tourists said, okay, well, we're only going to 
spend our money on ecotourism, then there wouldn't be the problem that we currently have. And so I guess part of, it's, part of it is about awareness because most people that I speak to have absolutely no idea what actually happens behind the scenes. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, a, and that's another thing that you uncover in the book is there's a lot of, it um, handled very well, but a lot of confronting scenes about that, about the kind of stuff that happens behind, behind um, closed doors or almost like hidden from the, from tourists so that if you don't have to, and it's Devon again, who, who's often reminding Hannah that people just prefer to, um, to ignore the reality that's, that's kind of staring them in there. Yeah, I did try to weave it through with a light touch and only give as much as was needed because I didn't want it to be a harrowing book at all. Um, so I think it kind of reflects the light and the dark of life, but doesn't doesn't go. I mean, yeah, I could have taken it a lot further in that direction, but I, I deliberately didn't do that. Yeah, definitely. No, it's not it's not gratuitous. It's just informative in a way that and that, that helps propel the story and helps the reader understand and learn at the same time as as your characters are. Um, so I mentioned earlier the story is told from Hannah's perspective and um, yeah, when we meet her she definitely doesn't know all that much about um, the customs of Thailand. Um, and in contrast Devon who soon sweeps her into her own world while she's traveling um, is very self-assured and very confident in what she's doing there. Um, but as it turns out, both of the characters have quite a lot to learn on this journey. And I wondered if you could talk a little bit about the transient nature of this novel, about how much both of the characters move around the country. And I also wonder if you could um, talk about how that helps them grow and also in some cases maybe hinders their growth. Yeah, the characters' relationship was the thing that I focused on most when I was going through subsequent drafts because I wanted to make sure that I had the tone and that, you know, exactly right at each point and that things were headed in the right direction. And in fact, even though that first draft, and this will maybe make the writers feel better, even though that first draft came out really easily, part three I completely rewrote because I feel like I got it wrong. So I I actually took the characters in a direction that they didn't actually want to go. I know this sounds really weird to people who aren't writers. <laughs> but um, when I realised that after getting some feedback from um, a writer friend, I scrapped part three and, and went back and just rewrote that. Um, and it then just really flowed out again in the same way that that kind of first draft did. So, yeah, I feel like I'm not really answering your question actually, but the, <laughs> but it was something I thought about a lot, trying to get that balance right. And Devon is this really kind of feisty, um, opinionated, mouthy kind of character. She really says what she thinks. And, um, and she can grate on people, you know, she can be a bit too much for some people. But, but Hannah kind of sees beyond that. So she's kind of in thrall of all that. She, she admires her ability to be outspoken and be like that. But at the same time, she also sees what's underneath all of that, which is that there's, there's things in Devon that she's actually also having to confront and deal with. And she connects with the elephants and their kind of broken spirits in this quite deep way, which I didn't realise when I was writing that first draft, actually, um, and is actually a really important part of the book. So she connects with these elephants in a way that Hannah doesn't quite um, because of her own experiences. Mm -hmm. So as they, as they, um, as Hannah and Devon move about the country, because they start off and they meet in Bangkok at the beginning and then, oh, they meet in Chiang Mai, sorry, they meet in Chiang Mai, they move around a lot and then they go um, and then they set off um, together. Mm. Um, how do you, how do you think that the places that they go draws them closer together is sort of what that first question was. I made it a little bit long, but yeah, how do you yeah. think what they go through bonds them more? Yeah, well, they do, they start in Chiang Mai and that's where they're working at a sanctuary. And then there's an event that happens that really kind of propels them into a different space where they go um, into another scenario, which is really more like the kind of behind the scenes of what happens in the tourism industry. And then from there they go to, and it is true, it's like different phases of their relationship, actually. 
Um, and then they go to Bangkok and eventually they end up in um, an area that's kind of near Ganchanaburi. Um, and yeah, each of those is kind of a different phase of the complexity of their relationship as it develops. But I don't think that I could actually really articulate in what way each one of those specific places. Like I wasn't, when I was writing it, I wasn't analysing that or thinking about it. Yeah. But you're right that it does. It's like every time they move, they're actually moving into a different phase of the way they're relating to each other. No, I think that's a think good that observation. <laughs> there's a, there's, um, I just, I just want to um, mention, remind the Zoom audience, if, um, if you have any questions, please start sending them through. I can see that there's a couple of messages in the chat box. So if they're your questions, Chrissy will um, bring them out um, soon when we head to the Q&A part of the evening with our um, live audience as well. Um, so next I wanted to talk, I want to talk a bit more about Anna and Devon's relationship. Um, there's a lot of tension, um, good and bad, in the novel. And I guess when I'm thinking about the movement through the country, I'm also thinking about how other people come into the picture because they're, of course, it's not just the two of them. Yeah. Um, that they're, they're encountering other backpackers and they're encountering other locals as well. And there's definitely, as their own relationship um, unfolds, it's it's not a straightforward one. And there's a lot of um, a lot of um, tension caused by action and also inaction and it's not one a couple of them they're both learning when to, when they should act and also when it's best not to act and it seems like as you said Devon's very feisty and at the beginning Hannah's kind of struggling to to find herself almost because it is very much a, a novel about growth and of, of the two of them together and also individually um, and Devon seems pretty self-assured, as I mentioned, but it turns out that she also has to learn at times when it's best not to act. And so I wondered if you could talk a bit about that tension of action and inaction throughout the novel and when, um, particularly in the context of volunteering as a foreigner in a country or being a foreign, foreigner who's moving through a country that is, that is not their own and a culture that is not their own. Yeah, well, I think there's any time you're engaging with another culture, especially when you're going to do good, it's actually a really fraught space. And there are various points in the novel where they have to confront that and actually confront with a, you know, they're, what they're doing there is actually helpful. Um, because so often, you know, volunteering in another country can actually be unhelpful, especially if it's not informed by a, a really kind of rich understanding of that culture. Uh, so there are various points where the characters have to face that within themselves and actually think about whether their actions have been for the benefit of, you know, the elephants or the community. Um, and they definitely make mistakes during the course of the book. Yeah. And what about the tension? What about um, the romantic tensions that you've got? building throughout the book. So there's also a point where another um, one of the girl's friends comes over for a visit and that also sparks a little bit of, of tension between them. So I wonder if you can chat a bit about writing with the relationship. Do you know how much I can give away? <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to ruin it. But um, yeah, so going back to the start of the book, Hannah is completely in thrall of Devon. She just thinks she is incredible. Like she's like nobody that she's ever met. She's very young. She, as you said, you know, she hasn't really found who she is yet. She's really kind of exploring that. And to her, Devon just seems so incredible that she, um, it's like she almost idolizes her really. And so as they go along and their relationship develops, you know, there, there is love and there's passion and, but it's a very complex relationship. It's not, um, it's not a relationship that I think you can easily define. So some people have tried to define it in one way or another when they're talking about the book, but for me, it's a very fluid relationship. And um, as you say, there are other people who come in who actually kind of challenge what's happening between them and change things and change the dynamics. Um, and it's a complex relationship and it's partly to do with the fact that Hannah is really coming to terms with who she is and, and what she wants and she questions that, you know, at various points along the way. You know, is this what I want? Is this who I am? What am I doing here? You know, and, um, and for Devon, she, for all her kind of bravado, she actually 
desperately wants to be loved and yet at the same time she can be very spiky she can really push people away it's like she's kind of testing them like do you really love me you know so there's all those kind of tensions that that play out mm -hmm. yeah i wanted to ask a bit more about that about that tension about the contrast between Devin and hannah and why um you wanted to write somebody who who does tend to push people away more who who acts who's very fiery i'm thinking of the example of um how Devon interacts with other with um, other volunteers early in the early in the book, she's a little bit more critical of them, even though they're there for a similar purpose to her. Whereas Hannah is much more open to their their behaviour. Just well, as I said, it wasn't really a decision. She, like Devon and Hannah really mm -hmm. kind of arrived. But I have to say. Um, writing Devon was so much fun. Like <laughs> just because she's a bit wild and she can do and say things that are kind of nuts and like it was just so much fun to write but also I do think you know people who are involved in that really kind of intense um, level of uh, animal welfare have to be really confident they have to be really passionate you know in order to achieve things they're really single-minded and that's what Devon's like you know she's very single-minded she she sees things in a very kind of black and white way and she will take anyone to task on it um, and I think that's really reflective actually of the kind of people who actually um, get involved and really go hard like really commit their lives to rescuing animals caring for animals you've got to have that kind of grit and passion that, that Devon actually has mm -hmm. and I guess that's somebody who is who has um who knows exactly what their path is there in, in Thailand as opposed to Hannah at the start where she's sort of finding it. She becomes, once she's, as she begins to learn more, she also starts to find herself in that, yeah. in that way too. Um, you mentioned Devon was um, a real joy to write. Were there any other parts that you really, or places that you really particularly enjoyed writing about? Maybe because you have memories of your own from that, those parts of Thailand? I mean, to be honest, the whole, almost the whole novel was a joy. I will say there were, there was this one scene that I knew that I had to write, which is probably one of the ones that you were referring to before, um, to do with the elephants, where I knew I had to write it and I didn't want to write it. Um, I don't know how much I can say, but it, it's involving the breaking process that happens with elephants. And I've watched it, I've never seen it myself. It's it's something that happens, you know, you don't have access to it. It happens in the, in the forests and, um, they take young calves who are only sort of two years old and they have a similar kind of lifespan to humans. So elephants live about 70 years. So they take these calves and they, they spend maybe seven days breaking, breaking them. And so I'd been watching videos of this process and just like weeping as I watched them. So, but I knew that I had to really know every kind of tiny detail about what actually happened in order to be able to distill it in a way that was truthful, but didn't go, I mean, if you go and watch them, I don't think you would ever ride an elephant or go and see an elephant in a circus. It should be like required viewing if you want to ride an elephant. Um, so writing a scene around that, I, I sort of put off. Actually, I skipped it in the book. <laughs> I wrote this book chronologically, but that scene I skipped and came back to. So everything else was really a joy to write but that one scene I did I was like oh, I don't want to write it yet <laughs> to come back to it at the end it wasn't the end it was but it was before that but um but yeah I did skip over it for a little while um I would like to talk a little bit more about the setting um and about your time in Thailand so what are some of your favorite memories from the country and what are some of the other aside from the the um, volunteering work that you've done what are some yeah. of your other favorite parts because I mean in Thailand I've literally spent almost my entire time with elephants <laughs> <laughs> so I almost can't separate it from that um, and some of my favorite moments were actually just with the elephants so there was this one moment when uh, so quite a lot of the elephants that are at the sanctuary for example uh, injured in a way that means they could never be reintroduced to the wild or you know a lot of them were still carrying tourists but they might have like a broken leg or you know and there was this one elephant that was blind in both eyes because um, if the elephants play up sometimes their mahouts the elephant handlers will slingshot them in the eye 
um, so that they're blind. Elephants don't have very good vision anyway, but it just makes them more compliant. And um, there was this one time when I was standing next to this elephant called Jokia, who was blind in both eyes, and um, she reached her trunk up and, and put it around me. And it was like having an elephant hug, and it was really beautiful. And I used that moment, I gave that moment to uh, Devon in the book. Um, but little things like that, you know, just little moments, because they're such incredible animals. They're so intelligent. And when you see them, so at the sanctuary, most of them don't have family, but they, they bond with other elephants and they form herds. And seeing the way they protect the babies and look out for each other, and it's just really beautiful. And we as humans could actually learn a lot about the way we live in this world from elephants. Um, that's just got me thinking, can you tell the audience a little bit about who I'm familiar with about the conservation efforts that the, that the um, I'm going to mess up the pronunciation here, the, Ma, the Mahmoud, Mahouts. Mahouts, yes, thank you, um, that they're involved in that we discussed at the beginning. So the, a lot of those um, organisations, they rely on volunteer work, but they're also set up by locals and yeah. managed by locals. Can you chat a little bit about how they yeah, so like, for example, in the, the sanctuary that the Save Elephant Foundation runs, every elephant has a mahout, which is the way it, it operates in the tourism industry as well. Um, but at the sanctuary, they're kind of like a glorified babysitter, really. They just go everywhere with the elephant. Um, they don't have any kind of implements, no ball hooks or sticks or anything like that. Um, but the elephant, they're responsible for that elephant. They're responsible for feeding it and, and looking after it and... Um, getting it into the shelter at night um, so that they're safe, uh, which means they don't have to be chained because, you know, otherwise they would just go rampaging off into the, the village. Um, so, so they have a very special bond, actually, the Mahout and the elephant, often really, really close relationship. Thank you. Um, I'm going to head to questions in a couple of minutes, so just um, another reminder, but I've got a couple more questions for you, Emma. Um, you mentioned earlier your inclusion of some Thai language in the book, even though um, you admit that you're not that you're not a fluent Thai speaker yourself now, but can you talk a little bit um, about why you chose to include the language in the way that you did? I read your, um, your note at the end of the book and I thought that was a really... Yeah, so... I I work as an editor, so all of these kind of choices around language are actually really important to me. And normally you italicize a foreign language just to, I guess it's to help guide the reader. But I made a deliberate decision not to italicize any of the Thai words, because I think what happens when you italicize a foreign word as English speakers, we just skip over it. because you're like, oh, I don't know that word. And the italics acts as a signpost. So I wanted to remove that signpost so that you start reading the words before you even realise that you're reading them. And partly that was because I wanted the reader to be immersed in the same way that Hannah and Devon are immersed in this language and, and having to grapple with a different language. Um, so it was really a very deliberate decision to try and throw the reader in there in the way that, and because it's told through first person, it's told from Hannah's perspective. I wanted the reader to be experiencing that as much as possible as well. Yeah, because Hannah mentions at the start when the Thai comes up, you again, you sort of, as a reader, unless you speak Thai, you definitely yeah. relate to Hannah because she doesn't, even though she's the one retelling it, she doesn't know what's, what's being talked yeah. about either. So it kind of encourages you to stop and look up what's being said. Too. Yeah. Um, what else do you hope that readers take away from this story? Uh, well, the main thing is I just hope they really enjoy it and that the characters stick with them because I think that's always the mark for me anyway as a reader. You know, the books and the characters that stick with you, it's a sign that the writer's done a, a good job. So I do hope that. And I guess I also hope that it might start some conversations around um, elephant tourism and also I think, you know, it's it's kind of a very serendipitous moment that this book has come out during COVID when none of us can actually travel because I think it, it gives us an opportunity to really reflect on how we engage with other cultures and how we might do that differently in the future. So I do hope it gives people that kind of pause to really think about 
maybe how they've engaged in the past and how they might engage in the future. I mean, I would have been one of those people who rode an elephant. I, the, the whole reason I came to all of this was because I wanted, because I loved elephants so much and I was looking at, I want to do, you know, an elephant trek. And it was only when I started Googling that I realised, okay, this was really not a good thing to do. So, yeah, so I hope it, it starts conversations around that. And the other thing that people have told me is because we can't travel at the moment, this is like armchair travel. <laughs> you, you can go and spend some time in Thailand with my book. <laughs> yeah, and it gives you plenty of um, different ways that you can encounter elephants without having to be a part of that. That's uh, very true. Um, so before we get to audience questions, I just want to ask what you're working on now, if you can tell us a little bit about it or what's next for you. Oh, I don't like talking about what I'm working on while I'm kind of in the middle of it, but I will say that um, I've just finished a second draft, which the first draft I really kind of wrestled with. It took me a very long time to get that right. And uh, the wonderful Tegan Bennett Daylight has looked at my second draft and given me some feedback. So I'm really ready to get stuck into that third draft but at the moment I just with all the publicity and stuff it's not going to happen so I'm hoping in maybe about a month I will get to that Excellent. that's all I'm going to say <laughs> Brilliant. well um does anybody in the audience have questions and if you're on zoom Chrissy will be passing on your questions to me in just a minute she's coming out now anybody I'll run the mic Hi, Emma. Um, before I ask my question, just you know, characters just coming to you and Tegan Ben at daylight. I'm feeling decidedly <laughs> envious right now. <laughs> um, but I just wondered if you had any sense of what's happened to the elephant riding industry you know, after COVID. Yeah, it's actually really sad. I mean, as terrible as the whole industry was before, of course, what's happened is without any tourists, um, the Thai people don't have who who use these elephants don't have any income, which means they they're struggling to feed their families, and they're also struggling to feed the elephants. So there's a lot of um, there's obviously a lot of Thai people struggling. There's a lot of elephants that are not even eating properly and um, just chained twenty four seven. Um, so Lex Chalet, who is the founder of the Save Elephant Foundation, has been kind of in overdrive. Mind you, she's always in overdrive. She's amazing. Um, but, you know, they have limited resources. It's very expensive to rescue an elephant. You, you know, you have to pay the owner for the elephant. It costs a lot of money because you're basically reimbursing them for what they would have earned from that elephant. And then there's limited space at sanctuaries and on various projects. So it's a really difficult situation right now and I guess once we can all start traveling the best thing that people can do is really do their research before they go and support some of those ecotourism models. Yeah. A couple of online questions if um, yeah. we can do one of them. Okay so one of the online questions here is um, and you may have answered it while I was serving a customer I hope you didn't um, was um, particularly Thailand what sparked your interest in those elephants in the first place in Thailand have you have you mentioned that while I was serving a customer no I can't answer that um, so my very first experience of an elephant was when I was eight and my parents I was living in England and my parents took me and my brother to see a circus and I don't remember anything about the circus. I didn't know at the time that it was horrible for elephants. Uh, but after the show, we, we had our photograph taken with an elephant. And I remember standing next to this huge creature and feeling this mix of both kind of awe and fear. And as I was standing there, the elephant's trunk just brushed against my cheek. And the, the mix of like the rough skin of the elephant, but the gentleness of that touch, I don't know, there's just something about it. It's just one of those moments where I look back and I think that's when my love affair with elephants started. And then when I was in my early 20s, um, I did travelling through Kenya and Tanzania and saw elephants in the wild. And, and after that, I was kind of desperate to do an elephant trek, but it took me many years until I got to the point where I was like, I'm really going to do this. And then that's when I Googled and all of this other stuff happened. <laughs> Another question here. Thanks, Emma. I'm just wondering with the work of Save the Elephant organisations, um, 
how they build a relationship with the local people to to make people want to work with them, I guess, and to bring about change and see that there's a benefit in that for them. Well, I guess the first thing is they're seeing that actually there is a change happening where more and more people are wanting to engage with ecotourism. So that is actually a shift that is happening, even though there's a long way to go. So the first thing is they can see that um, there is money to be made in ecotourism. Um, and then the second thing is that, you know, the elephants are happier and it's very obvious. So when I went to so my first experience in Thailand of elephants was the sanctuary and that's where they've all been rescued and they form these herds and there's a lot of noise and, you know, activity and it's all very glorious. But my next experience was going to work in a little village called Bantaklang, which means elephant village. And this is where there were like um, many, many elephants, hundreds of elephants that spend most of their time chained when they're not working. And um, it's completely different. So the elephants are silent. They're, they're not making any noise. They're not moving most of the time. You can see in their body language that, that they're completely different to the elephants of the sanctuary. And in fact, it's quite, quite a strange experience when you've been surrounded by elephants with all this movement and, and noise, and they're always touching each other all the time. They just touch each other. And then you go somewhere where they're engaged in tourism and it's just silent. It's quite, quite an odd experience. And I stayed in that village for several weeks in a little hut there and um, a lack of sound. I mean, you know, they do sometimes make noise, but the, it's very obvious because sometimes people say, oh, but the elephants seem happy. But if you, if you have spent time with elephants, it's very clear that actually those elephants who are taking the treks and so on, they're not, they're not happy, yeah. There's a question from um, Lisa online, who said, have you thought about um, speaking to high school students um, as your book may appeal to high school students who um, are looking at tourism and studying tourism and eco-tourism and um, Lisa said, having lived in Bangkok and in, in Thailand um, a few years ago, um, I really look forward to reading your book and, and think that it's important to talk to students. Mm -hmm. Oh, thank you. I would love to talk to students. And in fact, um, even so I've got another I've got, as, as you mentioned, I've got two kids books coming out as well. And one of them is a kids book on this topic as well. Um, and one of the things that I find is talking to kids and teenagers, like all ages, is they're so open to it in a way that sometimes adults aren't. Even li like little kids get it, you know, they really do. And um, actually, it's one of, it's something that I really enjoy. So high schools out there, you can invite me to your schools. <laughs> yeah, I think that would be an amazing idea because as you mentioned, you didn't realise what the elephants went through. And when I went to Thailand, I didn't either. I was only 18. And I think that that's teenagers in particular, if they're planning to go, you know, obviously post when we're allowed to travel again. Then... And also there's such a massive Instagram culture around all of that mm. stuff. Now you go and have a selfie taken with an elephant and, you know, all of that stuff. So, but yeah, there are actually, and the thing about ecotourism is that actually those experiences are far richer than going and riding an elephant and all those other things that you can kind of do. So yeah, definitely. I mean, Hannah and Devon are that young 20 something age, you know, and there's lots of people who travel at that age and yeah, it'd be great. It'd be great to talk to them. Any more questions? Yeah, we've got a couple more. <laughs> Hi, how are you? This is my brother. Oh, <laughs> Hey, so um, I noticed when I was reading your book that you wrote in a very Australian, like the language very Australian, um, and having read one or two of your other pieces, you don't necessarily always write like that. So was that a choice? Like even in like the narrative, the bits where like Hannah's narrating, like it's it's very Australian in the language you've used. Was that a choice or did it just like, was that one of your writers so that just flowed out that, things? That. <laughs> it's really interesting. I actually hadn't thought about it in that way. Um, and so no, it wasn't, it wasn't a conscious choice, but I suppose it's a reflection of observing Australians interacting in Thailand, which is, as I said, you know, when I was over there, um, I was always observing how people were behaving and interacting and also thinking about myself as a 19 year old, you know, traveling, cause I went off and traveled when I was 19. Um, and 
for you know for a number of years and thinking was I like that when I was that age and you know it was really interesting observing all of that so it's probably it wasn't a conscious thing but I'm sure all of that fed into it. Hi Emma. <laughs> I, what really stuck with me when you were uh, speaking just before was that there are no simpler answers to the whole issue right so we talk about the elephants and everything, but you know, you mentioned the the other side of the mahouts who make a living with um, with their work and, and the elephants. How much um, do you like? How do you bring that side in the book? Like, do we experience a, a, a mahout? Like, do we get to know one or several? Or I mean, not sure how much you can give away, but um, <laughs> I was just interested um, if you get to know a mahout. There is, there's this one key moment in the book uh, where Hannah realises that, you know, they've been so caught up in this idea that um, the Mahouts are terrible people, you know, that they're abusing their elephants and so on. And there's this one moment in the book where she encounters a Mahout who she had that perception of and realises that actually he's just a man with a family trying to do his best. Um, so there is certainly, it, it's all part, because it's told through Hannah's perspective, it's, it's part of their journey and their exploration and the change of their understanding as they kind of see that unfold and get deeper and deeper into how things are happening. So, yeah, there are definitely moments in there, but of course it's seen from their perspective. Time, Chrissy, do we have time for one more? Yeah, we have time for one more. There's okay. Is there any other questions going on Zoom? Yes. All right. Thank you very much, Emma, because it brings me back to my childhood with a, the really honoured and privilege to actually have lived with my parents in a place called the Mountains of the Elephants. And it was absolutely uh, interesting when, you know, my mom used to narrate stories of how the elephants played with my swing and we'd have them all free. But as I went through life and, you know, I've had um, a few turning points in life where I feel very much for the issue of elephant conservation and, you know, having done university with environmental education, can I ask you this question with Thailand and, you know, I go into the politics and the way a business is run. Uh, how would you see that all the money that's fed into, say, elephant conservation doesn't get rot by a system of corruption? Because my perspective of, you know, countries where you feel that some of the funds don't reach uh, and at the same time, you know, people, people want to know they've done the best for conservation. How do you see that? Yeah, I mean, that's a complex question. Um, and thank you. And I don't know that I've really got any answers to that other than to say that um, I know for sure that Lex Chalet, who runs the Save Elephant Foundation, she, her, her life is literally rescuing elephants. And, and she chose not to have children because she said that elephants are like her children. And they just, you, like, she because she spends so much time also off you know trying to arrange rescue and all that when you see her walk out into the sanctuary the elephants just run to her like they just adore her um and she just works all the time i don't know how she does it she's an absolute force so i mean i know that the funds that are going there are really going to do the thing that they're you know supposed to be doing but it's, it's very hard to know, isn't it? It really is. And some of the projects um, with the Save Elephant Foundation are about being in the community and trying to show people how to do things a different way. Because of course, all of these practices have been done for so long, they're really kind of ingrained in the culture. Uh, so when I was in Bantaklang, there's, there's a project there, which is sort of like, you know, in that grey area where it's talking about, all, not really grey area, but that kind of middle area where it's better than what's happening, but it's not the ideal. So the people who join those projects have to follow certain rules, you know, they're not allowed to um, have their elephants in a circus, they're not allowed to use a bullhook, all those kind of things, which is about saying to all the other people in that town, you know, you can still do this, but you can do it in a way that's not going to harm 
the elephant. Um, so I guess the only way you can really know, and it's still hard, but is to do your own research, which means you have to go into it quite deeply before you go over there. And there are things that you can look for in terms of, of giving funds. There are also things that you can look for in terms of choosing an organisation to engage with. Um, even when you go on the website, you can just say, well, are there bull hooks? If there are, don't go there. Are they offering elephant painting? If they are, don't go there. You know, all of those kind of things. But it's it's fraught and it's difficult. And in terms of the politics, you know, uh, LEC is always dealing with that and um, has had some really difficult things that she's been targeted with as a result of um, her work. Because it does confront the tourism industry, which obviously earns a huge amount of money. So that's why she's really trying to say, let's change the culture, let's do things differently. But yeah, it's it's difficult and I don't have an easy answer to that either, I'm afraid. Well, um, that is all the time that we have. Unfortunately, we could keep talking for a lot longer, I know. Thank you all so much for joining us tonight. Emma, it's been so lovely to be your first conversation partner on your tour. Congratulations once again. This is such a phenomenal, lovely book. I'm really, really pleased to have um, been the one to launch it with you. Um, please grab your copies from us at the front uh, counter if you're here with us tonight. And if you're on Zoom, um, you can also still grab a signed copy. What we'll do is if you'd like to grab one or a few, then you can give us a call on 38463422 and um, pop your order in over the phone and we will make sure that your copies are signed for you. So Emma, thanks again. Thank you. Thank you for asking me such lovely questions. And it's such a lovely thing to be doing in real life and Zoom. I've not done both before. I've done <laughs> one and the other, but not both at the same time. So I hope it worked out at the Zoom end as well. <laughs> it, did. it did, yeah. Thanks again, everybody. Have a lovely rest of the evening. Thank you.